Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Franz Deval. He is Emeritus Candler Professor at Emory University and Emeritus Professor at the University of Utrecht and author of numerous books, and today we're going to focus on his latest one, Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. So, Dr. Deval, welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I'm glad to be here, yeah. So, where would you say sex differences stem from? You mean physical or behavioral? So, let's focus on the behavioral then. Yeah, um, I think uh, mostly hormonal uh, and, and they evolve to serve certain purposes, of course. They, all, all behavior evolves to serve reproduction mm -hmm. uh, because reproduction is the, is the means by which we proceed, so to speak, and, and evolution um, promotes that. And, um, individuals who don't reproduce, who fail to reproduce, they are not represented in the genome and they, they don't pass on genes. And so reproduction is important. And so in the mammals, that usually means that um, there's a focus on caring for the female, caring for offspring because they need to be nursed and they need to be protected and so on. And protection is very strong, of course, in, in female mammals. And in the males, it usually means that they uh, compete over territory and dominance and who can meet, mate with the females in order to reproduce. And of course, in some males, uh, it also means caring for the young. So, so that's not excluded, is that um, we, have, we have to keep in mind that that's not an exclusively female task to care for the young. Mm -hmm. What can we learn about gender by studying other great apes like chimpanzees and bonobos, for example, and to what extent can we compare them to ourselves? Well, uh, we, we have to distinguish sex and gender. Gender usually relates to the, to the cultural side of the differences. Mm -hmm. okay. And so uh, gender I, I usually don't divide gender into male and female. I divide gender into masculine and feminine mm -hmm. and everything in between because the gender is a very flexible concept and it's a cultural concept. And I, I do apply it to other primates because other primates also learn um, things from others and, and they have a very slow development. So for example, a chimpanzee is adult when he's 16 well, 16 is, uh, that's a, a slow development right there. They, they have an enormous amount of time to learn things, just like humans. And that, that also means that their differences in behavior, we talked about differences between males and females, are, are partly cultural, are partly learned from others. They're not purely biological. It's, people often think that in animals it's biological, in humans it's cultural. But I think... In animals, it's also cultural, and in humans, biology cannot be excluded. Biology always plays a role. And so the, the differences in behavior that we see between us and the other primates, it's a very complex picture. That's actually the main message from my book, I think, is that culture comes in with them too. There are exceptions to the rules in their lives too. And we have two close relatives, it's not just one. If it was one, like the chimpanzee, it would be maybe fairly simple. But we also have bonobos who are exactly equally close to us. And the bonobos are very different. Bonobos are female dominated species and, and much more peaceful and much more sexual than the chimpanzee. And so, yeah, my, my main message is actually it's not so simple. Even though there are a few core differences and we can discuss that there are a few core differences between the sexes that we find in all three of them, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us then about that? What are some of the main differences between the sexes found in chimpanzees, bonobos and humans? Yeah, so one difference we see in all the primates is in the young, the young primates, we see that young females are very interested in infants, even before they have infants. So, so they're very young, but they hang around mothers who have a baby. 
and they and they want to touch the baby and hold the baby and if they're older they become the babysitters the, the mothers will trust them as the babies and and they will become babysitters and in the wild we also know that they uh, they pick up rocks and wooden logs and carry them as if it's a baby like so they make dolls actually and they they put it on them and if in captivity you give them a doll like let's say a teddy bear the, the females will hold it and and carry it and care for it if you give a doll to a young male it usually doesn't last very long because the young male will he, he will not care for it he will be curious and take it apart and things like that it's not it's not the same thing as with the females so that's the females the young males and this is also universal they like to rough house they like to to wrestle they like to we call it rough and tumble play and rough and tumble play in all the primates is more in young males than young females and in all human societies is more for boys than for girls. So, so that's, so in the young, we have some universal differences that we see in all three species and actually in all the primate species, I would say. Uh, and, and, and both of them are a preparation for adult life. So, so the, the female interest in, in dolls or infants is a preparation for when they become mothers and, and, and motherhood is very complex. People often call it the maternal instinct, but I think, there's a lot of skills involved and uh, the males prepare for a life of, of more competition and that's why they wrestle and but they also need to learn to control their physical strengths and and, and so the, the wrestling has a very important part in that mm -hmm. is the... so, so, so there's just the young ones I, I haven't even talked about the adults but yeah uh, yeah so uh, yeah before we get into the adults then um is there is there any way that the gender of particular individuals from particular uh, primate societies is also influenced by uh, so by how they are socialized i mean so for example in, in humans i mean that's more or less evident but there's does that also occur in other primate species yeah i think they self socialize i call it usually it's it's not like the adults tell them how to behave. And, and, and I would say in children, human children also, there's a lot of self-socialization by the young looking at how the adults act and, and emulating their behavior. And I think in the primates we see that, is that uh, young females, they learn a lot of skills from their mother. Young males look around more at, at the adult males around them. They don't have a, a clear father figure usually but there are adult males around and they watch them and they emulate them and so i think there's a lot of self-socialization there's not the same pressure it's not like if they act a little bit differently uh, that someone is going to punish them or tell them that that I, I think there's less pressure on them in that in that sense but um i do think they learn a lot of skills during their lifetime from just watching around them and that's why the sex differences that we see in, in, the, in the primates are not necessarily purely bio biological. There's a lot of learning involved in it. Mm -hmm. Can we say that there are also, or is there any, any evidence that there's also gender non-conforming individuals in other species? Yeah, yeah. So the, they clearly exist. They are, of course, not common. Otherwise, we wouldn't call them gender non-conforming. So, so they're unusual. But uh, I've known many. And in, in my book, I describe a female named uh, Donna, who, who was clearly a female in terms of her genitals. But um, in terms of her behavior, she was more masculine. So she, um, from a very young age, when she was two or three, a, a baby still she, she acted like a young male so the wrestling part that i mentioned she, she liked to wrestle with adult males and the adult males wrestled with her the adult males normally ignore young females they they they, they wrestle with young males but not with young females but uh, donna could wrestle with them and, and they had fun and uh, and that already indicated very young that she was different from the rest and then she grew up more male-like. She, 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 she grew the heavy, more heavy body structure of the males, more hair. 
She acted like a male. She would intimidate others like a male. She was not particularly aggressive, but that's what she would do. And so from a distance, if you didn't know, you would think that's a male. And uh, she was extremely well accepted in the group. Uh, and she's still alive today. So, so uh, and, and people sometimes ask me what, what she was like hormonally. And I think we've never really looked carefully at that. So uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have the data on that. But she was clearly an exception. I call her gender non-conforming. It's also possible that if she could talk, she would say that she identifies as a male. That's very well possible. So she could be transgender. And in the same way, we have also males sometimes who, um, who don't play the macho game. They, they may be big males, but are not interested in becoming the dominant male. They don't have that ambition and they and they don't seek confrontations with others. They avoid that. And, and so we, we have males who are gender non-conforming and females. Uh, I find it most interesting that, that there's no intolerance to these individuals. We don't notice that others reject them or ostracize them. We, I've never noticed that. And so um, th that's, that's a situation that's different with us, but I think Gender diversity, if that's what we call it, uh, is, is not unique to, the, to humans. And in addition, we can also talk about sexual orientation, uh, like um, uh, homosexual versus heterosexual. In that regard, we have variation also. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us now then about some of the main differences between male and female adults as you were about to do some minutes ago? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the, the males care a lot about their rank among the males. Mm -hmm. The females care a lot about their rank among the females. So both of them are, have hierarchies. Both of them have an alpha male and an alpha female. Um, the difference is, is that the males are, um, are very intent on trying to become the dominant. And, and, and the hierarchy among females, I think is more decided by age, uh, a combination of age and personality. So, so for example, an older female can, can be the alpha female. In males, when a male gets older, he's usually kicked out of that position by a younger male because it, it, it is more physical between them. It's more like a contest and uh, older males can have a lot of power, but they are usually not the alpha male anymore. Whereas in the females, um, the, I, I, my previous book was about mama, uh, the, al the alpha female of chimpanzees, and she was very old. She, she, she could barely walk anymore and she was blind and she was still the alpha female, which is in males would not be possible. So that's one of the differences is that the male is more physical combat and the females have a hierarchy too, but I don't think it's, it's determined by who's physically the strongest. I don't think that's the issue in their case. So that's one difference. Other differences in reproductive behavior, of course, is that females are the ones who carry the babies, hold the babies, feed the babies, protect them, the males also may be protective. For example, gorilla males and chimpanzee males can be quite protective of infants. So, um, but, the, but the female is the main caretaker for the babies. And um, what I find interesting, and I describe that in my book, is that the males have a capacity to do so. So that uh, I call that a potential. The, the male chimpanzee and the male bonobo, they usually don't do much with, with, with offspring. They don't carry them around. They don't do much with them. That's all female job. But if a, if a young chimp loses its mother, mm -hmm. they become orphan. Mm -hmm. Then they're picked up by males. The, the females, other females in the group, they have their own offspring. They, they cannot just pick up a baby and start caring for it. That that endangers the lives of their own kids. And so they they have no room for that. It's, not, it's just not a possibility for them. But the males, we, we have several observations from the field of adult males uh, adopting orphans. And not just for one or two days, but for years and carrying them around. So So I find that always interesting is that there is this 
fundamental difference is that the females do the offspring care more than the males, but the males have a potential to do that. They, they have a capacity to do that. And, and I think in the human male, that's the interesting part about the human male, is, is that's even more developed because human, humans evolved nuclear families and, and so male care for offspring is even more evolved in our species. And, and, and I know that sometimes conservatives make fun of, let's say, paternity leave. Uh, you know, we don't need paternity leaves. Maternity leaves they can understand, but not paternity leave. But I think um, caring for offspring is, is quite natural to our species and quite natural to the primates, even if in daily life most chimpanzees and bonobos don't do it. Mm -hmm. So before moving on to other topics, do you think then that the sort of prejudices that are very frequently observed in human societies are essentially cultural? Yeah, we, uh, we impose a lot of prejudices on our behavior. So we, we, um, we have opinions about how the genders behave and how they ought to behave, how they should behave. And, and these opinions are very strong and uh, they affect everything. And, and if, you, if, if as a child, if, if let's say you're a boy and you're not manly enough, people will make remarks about that. And if, if you're a girl and you're not feminine enough, that people are going to remark about that. Or, or joke about it, or, and, and, and even though it's a joke, it, it is still a signal you behave in the wrong way. We don't want mm -hmm. you to behave like this. And, and I think um, uh, that's unfortunate, but, but human society is very strict on that. And I think human society has pigeonholed people, like you're a man and you're a woman and you're homosexual, you're heterosexual, we have these boxes and everyone needs to fit in these boxes. And if, if they don't fit, we get upset. And um, that's of course something that the other primates don't have. They, they don't label, they don't have language, so they don't label. And they seem to accept the variation, the variability more. Now variability for the biologists is nothing unusual. So. Um, uh, all individuals are different. So, so, so you take two trees in the forest um, of the same species and, and they go, they're going to be different. We, we know that. It does all this individual variability. We're very used to that in biology. So it's a bit strange that in society we, we don't appreciate the individual variability. We, we put limits on it, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, um, there's a lot of pressure in human society that I don't notice in, in primate societies. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you specifically, so what about assumptions that we make about ancestral human violence and male dominance by studying chimpanzees and bonobos? Because if I remember correctly, at a certain point, you even criticize a little bit certain assumptions made by people like Richard Rangham, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, people who write about human evolution very often favor the chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. the chimpanzee is male dominated and violent and the anthropologists, they have developed this narrative about human evolution is that we got where we are by eliminating everybody else, the Neanderthals, the Australopithecus Sinai, we, we have eliminated our enemies and that's, that's why we are successful survivors. It's a very violent picture of human prehistory um, that doesn't sit well with me for two reasons. One is that the archaeological evidence for warfare goes back only 12,000 years. We don't have evidence. We have evidence for homicides before that time, but not for warfare. And so it's a big assumption to assume that before the agricultural revolution, which was 12,000 years ago, that before that time we had war. We don't know that, but it's always assumed and, 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 and people always assume that. So that's one reason that I have trouble with that scenario. The second is that uh, it forgets about bonobos. 
we have chimpanzees and bonobos as our closest relatives. They're both exactly equally close to us. So both need to be part of the story. If we tell a story about human evolution, we cannot just stick with the chimpanzee. And, and, and some people do that and some people highlight the chimpanzee and push the bonobo out because the bonobo is too peaceful and too sexy and too female bonded and too female dominated. There are things that they don't like in the bonobo. And, and, and I don't understand that. I think it's wonderful to have a peaceful close relative. What's the problem with it? But uh, people want to push them out. So I think we, um, that narrative about human evolution that we, we got where we are by being violent, um, is disturbed by the bonobo. The bonobo tells us, hmm, maybe that's not the whole story. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe female leadership was part of it, or at least sexual behavior and being peaceful was part of it. We don't know our history, but, but the bonobo puts question marks behind a lot of things. And that's why I, in my book, I like to highlight the bonobos also. Mm -hmm. Do you think it makes sense to talk about alpha males and also, for that matter, alpha females in human societies? Yeah, I think so. We usually use the term in primatology for the highest ranking individual. There's always a hierarchy mm -hmm. and there's always someone on top. Um, and and we, we use the term alpha male, alpha female without necessarily giving a description of their behavior. We just say that's the highest ranking male. He can be a good male, he can be a bad male. We, we, we don't say that necessarily that he is a good, a good alpha male is, is, is more like a leader who keeps the peace and keeps the group together. But you also have alpha males who are like bullies and, and beat up everybody and everyone is afraid of them. So just like in human society, we have leaders who we love and who are good for us. And we have leaders who, um, uh, yeah, who, who, who are dictators, you know, a, a dictator is also an alpha male. So um, I think it, it is good to use that terminology, but um, in the business literature nowadays, if you look for books on alpha males, you only find the negative descriptions. Well, they, they consider it positive. They say how to be the biggest male who has the biggest parking spot and the biggest office and how to re remind everyone every day that you're boss. And they see that as positive, but <laughs> what they describe, in my opinion, is a bully, not a leader. Uh, because a leading, a good leader, uh, also in chimps, uh, a good leader is someone who breaks up fights, keeps the peace, protects the underdog, is empathic. Uh, yeah, a, a good leader and, and usually a good alpha male is loved by the whole community. And, and if his position is challenged by somebody else, a younger male, they're going to defend the old guy because they want to keep the old guy. But you also have alpha males who are bullies, and just like in humans, I think we have that whole variation. We have dictators also, and and the group usually likes to get rid of them. And so so then when there's a challenger, they they prefer to to support the challenger. Mm -hmm. So about alpha males, one very interesting aspect you mention in the book: are they really so much more successful when it comes to reproduction compared to? Uh, lower ranking males yeah that is uh, initially you know w when we didn't have dna data uh, to test paternity the assumption was that alpha males do almost all the offspring uh, the sire almost all the offspring uh, because if you look at, at, at a monkey group or a chimp group and you look at who mates with whom what you see is the alpha male mating with females because he has no worries. He can do that. No one is going to attack him when he does that. And, and you don't see the other males doing it. So, so we assume that the alpha male, maybe 90% of the, of the young that are born are sired by him. When we, for the first time, started to collect DNA data to test paternity, all of a sudden, we found that there's lots of other males who sire offspring. 
which means that they are doing it at night or they're doing it behind the bushes. We also know that the females are very much involved. Initially, we ignored the females, like, you know, on the assumption that the male decides who mates with whom. Now we know, and it's called female choice. We know that the, the females have ways of mating with males that, that we don't see, we, we scientists. So, so now we know from the paternity data that um, alpha males, well, alpha males sire more offspring than most other males, that's for sure. So, so it has a benefit. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so, from an evolutionary perspective, they wouldn't be so driven to be alpha male. So it has benefits, but it is not nearly as big as we used to assume. We, we used to assume 90%, and I would say um, it's much lower than that. Mm -hmm. So just to break down some other assumptions that people usually make, uh, is it the case that females, uh, human females, and perhaps females from uh, other ape societies have sex with multiple partners and what would be the benefits for them? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Is that for, for a long time in biology, not just the primates, we assumed passivity in the female. Female sexuality was passive. It was the males who decided everything. It's a very old Victorian prejudice, I think, that, that was everywhere in biology, also in the birds and everywhere. Uh, I think the first break in that came when we, when we did paternity testing on eggs in birds, in the bird nests. Because everyone had always assumed that, of course, you have a male and a female and, and they're monogamous and the male fertilizes the female. That's what we assumed. Now it turns out that there's quite a few birds where the the eggs in the nest come are you know are fertilized by different males and and initially they didn't know what to do with that they they said maybe these females are raped by certain males or you know but now it turns out that females are very enterprising and sometimes mate with other males and and in the primates we have uh, there's many females who mate with many males so now we have a different view. First of all, we have a, a, a view of female sexuality as not so passive, it's quite active, and there's female choice involved. And the second thing is how to explain that a female mates with many males, in, for example, in the primates. Why doesn't the female just decide, because the female can get pregnant only from one male, mm -hmm. usually. Why doesn't she decide that's the one I want and the rest I ignore? But that's not what she does. She mates with a whole ton of males. And um, there are theories about this. So for example, Sarah Hardy is an anthropologist. She has um, a theory about why females may mate with lots of, uh, lots of males. And one of the reasons may be to prevent infanticide. So infanticide is a problem for the females because males will kill infants when they're very young. Um, and the thinking in that field um, and the thinking of Sarah Hardy is that males may follow a sort of rule, like don't attack infants of females you've had sex with. The, ma the males don't know who their offspring are. They may, they may not even have a concept of that they are fathers of offspring, you know, they, they may not know that. But if they follow a rule, a sort of general rule, don't attack females and don't attack offspring of females that you had sex with in, in the recent time, then that's a way for them not to kill their own infants, you know. And so uh, Sarah Hardy has this idea that, that females, for example, the female chimpanzee, that she mates with a lot of males in order to, to reduce the risk of infanticide. Because all these males who have mated with her, they had recent sex with her, and, and so they may be standoffish. So, so it's an interesting theory. I, I, I think um, it, it may explain the, re, the it may explain why females have so much uh, so many partners instead of just one. Uh, and, and so the. For the f female sexuality, that means that um, it's much richer and much more enterprising than we've always assumed. Mm -hmm. 
And is it really the case that men really have much higher sex drives than women? Can we be sure about that? No, we cannot be sure. So uh, that, that is always the assumption in psychology that the male sex drive is higher. But we now know from certain studies that um, women are not, if you ask how many partners do you have, you know, you ask men how many sex partners do you have in, in, in the last couple of years, men always come out higher than, than women. They have more sex partners. Um, but we now know from certain studies that women are not entirely open about this. And, and that's partly because our society doesn't accept that they have a lot of partners. And so uh, women, uh, women don't tell the truth. The, the, the man may tell the truth. If, if they say, I had five partners in the last couple of years, they may be telling the truth. But the women, they, they will reduce the number. And so um, in that regard, we know now that um, these data are, are not always trustworthy. I, I'm not a big fan of questionnaire data anyway. I, I don't trust people enough to to rely on what they what they answer to questions. So um, that's one thing that we know. And then if you look at sex drive in terms of wanting sex and how strongly you want it, uh, I don't think it is a settled business to say that men have a stronger sex drive. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at masturbation, which is often taken as a good measure of sex drive because Masturbation doesn't require you to get a partner or to to be enterprising, to even go out of the house, you know. So, um, and it has no risks of disease or pregnancy or nothing. And in terms of masturbation, yes, men do more than women. And, and, and I would say that's for the primates is also true. But it's interesting that in the primates, in other primates, the females do masturbate. So for example, female bonobos who have a big clitoris, they do masturbate quite a bit. And uh, that already indicates right there that pleasure and sexual pleasure is part of their life. Uh, otherwise, that it would make no sense for them to masturbate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talking about the female orgasm, do we know if it has been selected for or is it just a byproduct? Yeah, my guess is that it has been selected for hmm. because all female mammals have a clitoris. The mouse, the elephant, all of them have a clitoris. And we know now the clitoris, for example, in humans ha has been studied extensively. Uh, the clitoris has as many nerve endings, so is as sensitive as the penis. So, so, so if it was just a byproduct, the clitoris was unimportant, let's say, then why put so many nerve endings? That would be sort of ridiculous, it would be wasting nerve endings right there. So uh, I know that Freud, Freud was responsible for um, uh, downplaying the clitoris. He, he, he's the one who gave us the vaginal orgasm. Um, even though now very few anatomists believe that um, that the vagina has has the nerve endings uh, apart from the clitoris, but the vagina itself doesn't have much to offer in terms of pleasure. So, so we, we think it's the clitoris that is the, the main instrument uh, to achieve orgasm. And um, the clitoris is very big in bonobos, very big in dolphins. The dolphin has the biggest clitoris of, of all mammals. And, and both species, bonobos and, and dolphins, have a lot of sexual interactions going on, also between females. Um, so, so I don't think it's accidental that these very sexually active mammals have a big clitoris. I think pleasure is, is, a, is a main factor in all of this. And, and, and in humans, of course, um, even though um, Freud tried to downplay female pleasure and, and down to play, downplay the role of the clitoris, I think that has completely changed. We don't, we don't believe that anymore, that the clitoris is unimportant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
is forced copulation an effective mating strategy? Because, I mean, among certain evolutionary biologists and even some evolutionary psychologists in uh, recent years, I mean, recent years since the 90s, I guess, there's been the idea around that uh, rape might have evolved as an adaptation, for example, but does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of at all of that theory, mm -hmm. uh, rape as a, an, a, an adaptation. Uh, there's sort of two issues with it. One, one is that you would have to show that that men who rape are are genetically different. So, so the, the, there are genes for raping, so to speak, are genetically different from other men. I've never seen evidence for that. Uh, and the second thing is you would uh, have to demonstrate that raping pays off in terms of reproduction, is that, um, that raping leads to higher reproduction for these males. Mm -hmm. Never seen good evidence for that. Because, for example, raping is also aimed. Uh, men also rape individuals who, who cannot, they cannot reproduce with. They rape women who are older. Um, they, they rape women who are younger. They rape other men. So, so rape is not specifically targeted necessarily on the category that you would expect if reproduction is the main issue. Um, and uh, no, and, and if I look at the other primates, uh, rape is extremely unusual. So in orangutans, which are also apes, uh, rape occurs by, by younger males usually, by not fully grown males. Um, but other than that, in the primates, it, it's a very unusual behavior. For example, I've worked with uh, chimpanzees in captivity all my life. I've probably seen a thousand copulations and I've never seen a forced copulation. So it's, it's not something that on a regular basis we see happening. So people always think that, that rape uh, is a sort of primitive behavior that of course the primates do more than humans. I think humans do more of it than, than the other primates. And I think part of the problem in humans is that people live in houses and, and so they are isolated from the rest of the community uh, and, and and rape, we know that most of the rapes occur within families or between individuals who know each other. Uh, I, I think it's it creates an environment that is different and that makes it more possible than in the other primates. Now, in, in bonobos, rape would be an impossibility because the females dominate the males and the females will certainly not accept that kind of behavior. They, they're very, but even in chimpanzees, uh, rape is a, is a highly unusual behavior. So it's not something that we find very much in our closest relatives. And, and that's another reason for me to say, well, I don't see how that theory works uh, very well, you know. Mm -hmm. Is there a definite answer to the question of uh, if there's a dominant mating system in humans? I mean, can we say that if we are uh, at least tendentially monogamous or polygamous? Ah, I find that hard to say. You have to ask that an anthropologist. <laughs> I think monogamy is more an ideal than an actual description of human behavior. Um, mm. In, in, and also in other animals, you know, we, we, we used to assume that birds, many songbirds are monogamous because the male and the female and the nest and the, the chicks. And, um, but we now know we, we make a distinction in biology between social monogamy and genetic monogamy. Genetic monogamy would mean that all the offspring in the nest come from the male and the female who guard the nests. That would be genetic monogamy, but it basically doesn't exist. It's very rare. Social monogamy is that a male and a female stay together and there are exceptions in terms of sexual behavior. Uh, and that's more a description maybe of human monogamy also. It's a, a, a social phenomenon. And, and yes, many societies nowadays, they have that kind of monogamous arrangement of male-female offspring. Uh, but you have to ask anthropologists how universal that is and, 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 and if it has always been there, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that 
when we're talking about gender, it makes sense to talk about instincts. I mean, is the word does the word instinct make sense there? We don't use it much anymore mm -hmm. in, in animal behavior. So, so people often assume in, in humans, things are cultural, uh, social, and in animals, they are instinctive. I think that's a dichotomy that I don't agree with. In animals, there's an enormous amount of learning that goes into their behavior. And, and so even a term like, let's say, maternal instinct, we, we mm -hmm. use it still. Maternal instinct. I think the attraction to infants, I mentioned that for young primates, is definitely there. And, and I think that's true for humans, that's true for other primates. In that sense, there's something biological about it. But maternal behavior is very complex. It, it's not self-evident to nurse a baby and to hold it against your nipple and all of that is not self-evident. And so maternal behavior has many aspects that need to be learned. So, so for example, if, if a zoo has gorillas and one of the females gets pregnant and and this gorilla group has never had babies we know that there's a problem we know that that female is going to fail she, she's not going to be able to nurse that baby because she, she will not hold it right she may even sit on it she may abandon it she may as soon as the baby puts his mouth on, on her nipple retract it because it's maybe painful. There's all sorts of reasons why that female gorilla is not going to nurse. And so what the zoo will do is they will bring in a human mother. A mother with a baby and they will ask her to, um, to nurse the baby in front of the gorillas and she will do that. And she will do it day after day and the gorillas will see the nursing and they will pay close attention. And that increases the chance that the gorilla who gets a baby will do the right thing with the baby. So, so there is instruction. We need instruction. And, and I think, so even a behavior like maternal instinct has a lot of learning that goes into it. And, and, and that's why the term instinct is not so much used anymore. We, we, in, in animal behavior, we, we increasingly drop the word instinct. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point in the book, and now focusing on humans, you say that human social organization is characterized by a unique combination of male bonding, female bonding, and nuclear families. So I think you've already talked about nuclear families. Could you explain the male bonding and female bonding parts of it? Yeah, the, the male bonding we share with chimpanzees. Hmm. The female bonding we share with bonobos. So, so humans are special in that we have both of them. Mm. I think in chimpanzees are more male bonded than female bonded and bonobos are more female bonded than male bonded, but we have both, which is really interesting, I think. And if you look at the books by psychologists, I'm, I'm a biologist, but I've been teaching psychology for 25 years. If you look at the psychology books, they always talk about female relationships. They, they think that the female friendships are more profound and better and more elaborate than those of males. And, and, and they have a description of male behavior, which is, which is like competition. Males are competitive. They, they have rivals and their friendships are fairly superficial. That's, that's a description in psychology books. And I don't agree with it at all. I'm from a family of six boys. I believe males have friendships and relationships and, and, and are high, highly cooperative. For example, men can be very cooperative when they hunt or, or during war. So I, I don't agree with that. And I think male friendships are real and important and they exist and they last a long time. So, so but the psychology textbooks emphasize female friendships. You go to the anthropology textbooks. It's all about males. It's all about brotherhood and initiation rituals and cooperative hunting and cooperative warfare. It's all about male relationships. And so the anthropologists they emphasize the male bonding and the psychologists emphasize the female bonding. And I would say we have both. There was recently a study where uh, what they call a meta-analysis, where they looked at all the studies done by economists on cooperation. 
uh, cooperative games, you know, what you do is you, you put five people in a room and you say you can only win if you cooperate with somebody yeah? and, uh, and you get a cooperative game. So they, they reviewed all these studies. So this was hundreds of studies and they looked for gender differences and they didn't find them. The, the, basically, men and women are both very cooperative mm -hmm. and there's not a huge difference between them. So I think um, we have both tendencies. We have male bonding and female bonding tendencies. And then on top of that, we have nuclear families, which is uh, which is the male-female cooperation right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So earlier you mentioned that in humans we have or we find higher levels of paternal investment. Do you know what could have been the selective pressures that selected for those higher levels of paternal investment? Yeah, I don't... I, I don't know. I think when we left the forest, our ancestors left the forest, they came in, in a dangerous environment because we tend to think that our ancestors were, were the boss, you know, we, we, our ancestors ruled the savannah. I think they were prey. I think, I think they were scared to death because there were lions and hyenas out there and they were twice as big as they are nowadays. So what are you going to do against a lion? What are you going to do against the hyenas? Nothing. And, and so they were scared to death. And that's why our ancestors for the longest time still climbed trees. We know that from, from the foot structure, the, the big toe in, in the foot, which indicates climbing abilities. We know that for the longest time, our ancestors, even though they walked bipedally and were on the savannah, they still slept in the trees probably because they were scared to death. Now, if you live in that kind of scary environment, I think the, the males need to get involved somehow for, 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 for the females and the young to survive. So, so let's say you see, you spot a predator approaching and you all need to flee. Someone needs to pick up the little ones or protect them. Need, I think males needed to be involved in protection and carrying, at least. That's the minimal. Uh, maybe if maybe they didn't do anything else, but at least they became more protective and, and more helpful in, in, in transportation. And then out of that grew maybe other behavior. That's I'm just purely speculating here. This is purely speculation. But out of that grew maybe other behavior where they also shared food with them. And, and, and started to, to do other things. Um, I think the nuclear family probably relates to that environment, which was a very scary environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you now, when it comes to sex differences in behavior, do you think that uh, ignoring them could have negative consequences? You mean... A Ignoring in society that men and women are different? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think there are some negative consequences possible. So, for example, I saw that Gloria Steinem, feminist, famous feminist, had argued one time that, that we should raise boys more like girls. We should raise our daughters and sons in a similar way. And so we should raise our sons, maybe make them more sensitive and empathic, more like girls. I don't agree with that personally. Yeah. I think boys, they will be more violent. We know that from all the primate studies that males are going to be more violent. We know from all the human studies, you look at the homicide statistics of any nation, the males are more violent. So. so boys will turn more violent and they will become stronger than girls. They, they, their upper body strength is quite a bit bigger than that of girls. So here you have a combination of boys growing up becoming more dangerous, basically. They become, they become more dangerous. They become stronger and, and, and more violent and more dangerous. And I think that requires a different approach in education. You need to teach boys that um, that they respect women, that there's nothing wrong with respecting women, and that they uh, their strengths, their physical strengths, 
need to serve society instead of disrupt society. They need to they, they need to have a sense of responsibility. Like I'm the stronger guy, I need to behave like this. And so, I don't agree with that we should be raising boys like girls. I, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should take into account that kind of very basic differences. Uh, I, I'm not saying that you should raise boys to be fighters or to say that they have to play football or uh, no, I, I, I would never say that. You have to teach them responsibility for what for their actions. And also for girls, I'm, I'm not saying that since motherhood fits the female much more than the male, that you need to raise them to be mothers. I, I think if, if a girl doesn't want to be mother, then that's fine too. Um, but if they have a tendency to want to learn in that regard and to to hold babies and carry them around and stuff like that, you you also don't want to stop them, of course. So I think we we need to have a fairly relaxed approach to how we raise our children and and be less stereotypical about it than we usually are. But we cannot just act as if they the the two sexes are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess we've been talking about this through the entire interview, but what about, on the other hand, exacerbating sex differences, like, for example, conservative people sometimes do when they talk about fixed gender roles, for example, I mean, that would be problematic as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen, for example, uh, Rick Scott, who's, I, I believe, a senator in Florida, who says men are men and women are women. And that's that talk of the binary, basically, like men and women, and they need to be real men and real women. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that because I think um, sex, biological sex is indeed almost a binary. It's not a complete binary. There's one or 2% of individuals who don't fit the binary physically. And that's just the biological sex. So even biological sex is not a simple binary. If you go to gender and how, which, which is how you express yourself, gender expression. If you go to gender, things are not binary. I would never call gender binary. I think gender has a duality, which relates to the biological side of things. But uh, gender is a much more flexible concept. And so we have, um, in humans, we have an enormous variability. Um, and, and, and we cannot just deny that. We, we, we cannot act as if that variability doesn't exist and, and put everyone in one of the two pigeonholes that we have. Um, and I think the politicians, they would maybe love to do that. And they're playing games with it now by ramping up all the, the cultural rhetoric that they have on that in that regard, uh, stirring up feelings. Um, uh, I, I don't agree with that. I think the situation in humans is much more complex than we think. And if we look at our closest relatives, we see some of that variability there too. So, so it's not something that we invented necessarily. I think that variability can be found uh, everywhere. And, and for biologists, that's not unusual to think like that. There's a famous saying by um, a sexologist, um, Milton Diamond, who said, um, biology loves variability. Unfortunately, society hates it. And, and I think that's the situation we're in. There, there is always biological variability and we should recognize that, but society likes to, to divide things in very clear categories. Mm -hmm. So just to sum things up and to wrap the interview uh, before we go. Uh, what, uh, how would you put it is if someone asked you, are there sex differences in humans? Yeah, I would say, yeah, there are. There are sex, behavioral sex differences in humans, some of which are these core differences that, um, that are represented in the majority of individuals, not necessarily in all of them, but in the majority of individuals. So that's the biology. If, if you ask, does society influence these differences? Um, I would say absolutely. 
I think culture is a very powerful tool that we humans use all the time. And so, uh, yeah, uh, society has an enormous influence in, in whether certain tendencies are enhanced and, uh, let's say, violence of males. A society can enhance it and, and make it worse, and uh, maybe a society who, which is at, at war will make it worse, you know. Uh, or a society can try to suppress it and control it and, um, and reduce it um, by means of education and so on. And, and, and so I think culture always has an effect on these, on these differences, whether they are amplified or modified uh, and so on. Okay, very well. So the book is again different, Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. I love the book, by the way, Dr. Duval, so thank you so much for writing it, and I'm a very big fan of your work in general. So uh, thank you again so much for taking the time to come on the show, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliz, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.